Hello and welcome. I'm Michael Pearson. This is The Human Condition. We are doing Chapter 8, the Results section of the EEG and ERP for Complementary, Alternative, and Functional Medicine Practitioners, their Patients, and Technicians. Once an EEG and ERP is done, it's important to correlate it with the symptoms and observation that the doctor or clinician has seen and collected. And in my opinion, it's very useful to have a physical examination, a neurological examination that looks at functional neurology below the area of the brain that can be detected with EEG and ERP. Now, EEG and ERP does a great job of detecting the cortex, the surface of the brain and the deep brain down to the limbic system. But it doesn't really check the thalamus and the basal ganglia, the brain stem and the cerebellum, the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. So this is very useful for us to have a, a neurological examination by a skilled clinician. It's also useful to have a, a physical exam that may not be neurological, that looks at the digestion, that listens to the heart and lungs, that uh, looks at the lymph nodes and the circulation, looks in the eyes, ears, nose, and throat, the tongue, facial nerves, and perhaps basic sensory and motor function or balance function. So all of that is very useful to correlate with the EEG and ERP. Now, psychologists and social workers are not licensed to touch the patient and do examinations and interpret the physical diagnosis of a patient. So we like to do this for them and, and serve them in that way. It's very, very useful and it's a great teamwork approach. In addition, uh, psychologists and social workers are not licensed to uh, order lab tests and interpret lab tests. So we like to help with that. We like to look at everything from blood tests and saliva and urine tests and fecal tests for uh, the microbiome, which is extremely important in depression and anxiety to, and mental health and schizophrenia, to um, you know, anemias and adrenal dysfunctions and, and male and female sex hormone imbalances, looking at things like menopause and the pituitary gland, understanding the mental health aspects of metabolites of neurotransmitters that can show up in the urine, looking at oxalates, looking at uh, uric acid and gout, pseudogout, all of these things are, are massively contributing to brain function. And so we like to assist the mental health professional because um, while we can do certain things that they can't do, we can't counsel. We, we are not counselors and we're not licensed to provide a mental health counseling approach. And, and we see that that's incredibly important. And I think everybody in in natural medicine acknowledges that there must be in, in mental health a good counseling. And in fact, the literature shows very clearly that for, in general, talk therapy is superior to drugs across the board for most mental health conditions. Now, that doesn't mean that drugs are not necessary sometimes, and it doesn't mean that in some cases drugs are more powerful and more effective than talk therapy. But in general, the literature is very clear that broadly, talk therapy is far more effective across large categories and numbers of people than drug therapy is for most mental health conditions. So we need to have talk therapy by trained experts like social workers and um, marriage and family counselors and uh, psychologists who do that kind of counseling. Because certainly the functional neurologist, the functional chiropractor, the, um, the nutritionist, the naturopath, the um, traditional Chinese medicine doctor or acupuncturist or licensed acupuncturist, all of us that do functional medicine, chemistry and electricity really don't do the talking and the counseling part and are not trained or licensed to do that. So everybody's got to come together and do all this together. And I think it, it makes for a much better outcome and a much better assessment. And a team approach of integrative medicine where we can come together and, and prioritize what's the most important thing to do first for this patient, because it's not the same for everybody. And it's not the same for every diagnosis. Every depressed patient is not the same. One depressed patient may require acupuncture as a priority and not diet and bowel function. Another patient requires diet and bowel function immediately uh, and not acupuncture. Another person may require a supplement change of B vitamins. So it really depends on the individual, not their diagnosis. It depends on what I call their microdiagnosis, beyond their diagnosis. If they've got a de depression diagnosis, they have lots more factors to um, consider in what is the most important causative and correlative agents in the etiology or the cause of their, of their illness. And so we have, to, we have to think. We have to provide some creative thinking. So when we, when we present the results to a person, we want to integrate the results to understand how did they get into this mess? How did they develop it from childhood or from earlier adulthood? Was it a chronic long-term problem, as are most of the ones that I talk about? I don't do much acute medicine. Most of the work I do is, is chronic and cold cases, although sometimes uh, acute cases. The idea is 
to be able to report results that help us paint a picture and explain how a person got to a problem and, and what is the proposed mechanism. We also want to be able to report testable hypotheses. I think this happened to you and I think this pathway got messed up. I think this is what went wrong. I think the solution is this change and we'd like to try the solution. That pathway takes about this amount of time to get fixed. We should see some results in a certain period of time, a number of weeks usually. And um, in general, most systems and textbooks would say that you don't have much more than three months to work on a patient without either changing their diagnosis or changing their treatment regimen. If neither of those change for more than three months of, of continuous treatment, then, you know, something's wrong. If a patient breaks off of care and goes away and comes back, you can restart that care. But usually if they're gone for more than a year, most guidelines would say you need to do a re-workup. You need to do a re-exam and start over with um, laboratories. Sometimes I'll let laboratories go for a year or two, but generally if it's been a year or two, I, I, I need to have labs redone Imaging, x-rays, it, it all depends. It's a doctor's discretion and patient's discretion. Many doctors like to see x-rays every year or two, depending on how bad the condition is. But if two years have gone by, most doctors that are treating a bone condition, uh, like a subluxation or, a, or an arthritis, are going to want to see any progression in, in bone. So, you know, two years, they're going to want to see another follow-up x-ray if there's still active pain. So the results often need to be integrated. It, it's very difficult with a patient to do these piecemeal reports of findings where you, you give them just their EEG results, but you don't give them their EEG results or QEG results in context with the rest of their case. So you want to be able to describe to them how their brain waves might have been created by their lifestyle, or their brain waves may create their symptoms, or their symptoms may drive their brain waves. Whatever your clinical theory is, you should present that, and you should write it down and stand by it and then tell the patient that you could be wrong and that you will probably make changes to some of that. I tell patients it's not a matter of whether I'll be wrong, it's a matter of how much I'll be wrong and when I'll be wrong. I am going to make clinical educated guesses about you, and I'm going to put them on the paper, and I'm going to track them, and I'm going to see how accurate I am, and some percentage of what I say will be wrong, and I'll be able to prove it. And I'm, I want to set up testable hypotheses and prove them, or disprove them rather, so that I can figure out what's wrong with you and get you better. So that's the, the general idea, is a patient needs to know how does the frequency and amplitude and location of what's wrong with their, with their brain waves correlate with their lifestyle, their diet, their sleep, their um, mental health schema or strategy, how they approach life, are they very high strung, are they too low key, you know, are they obsessive compulsive, what types of, of things are they in? And that really gets to the last part, which is the client categories. We want to try to categorize the patient and tell them how we see them, not as a bias that says you're the, you are this type of person, but you're presenting with this type of, of majority symptom. So we might say, you are a primarily gut patient, or you are a primarily acupuncture meridian energy patient, or you are a primary emotional patient, or you seem to be a primary diet patient, or you are a primary cardiac patient, or you are a primary spine patient, you are a primary brainwave patient, you are a primary brain chemistry patient. You are a primarily autoimmune patient at this moment. And so we like to try to, to um, I like to try to achieve some kind of agreement with the patient that they agree that they fit in that category and that's the problem and we're working on that. Now, I don't have to achieve agreement. If the patient doesn't agree, but they're willing to, to go down a road for a certain period of time, like three to eight weeks and try out my theory, even if they disbelieve it, if they're willing to go along and, and they're in good spirits and not too oppositional, they might really enjoy the process of saying, wow, I, I discovered that my main problem isn't this, it's that. So um, you want to have testable hypotheses where you can do an intervention, you can see what the outcome is, and you can infer what you think the pathway was. Now, you'll never be absolutely correct with this, and you'll never be able to absolutely prove that you were right, but you have a probability of being right with that particular pathway. So I think making a commitment to what you think the client's category is today or this phase of their care is very important to be able to stake a claim and say, I think this is the priority of what's wrong with you and what needs to be fixed first. And certainly with chronic patients, there's usually lots of things that are out of order and lots of things that need to be fixed, but we can't address them all at once. And certainly some things are much more important than other things. So as we look at those 
we have to make a commitment to, I think this is more important than that, and here's why. And so you have to make that clinical reasoning and make it part of your report of findings. And that is chapter eight results.